Good morning and welcome to the Deanery Garden at Canterbury Cathedral on this Thursday the 14th of April. It's Maundy Thursday, this significant day in Holy Week, the Thursday of Holy Week, and so many aspects to this day which we shall explore together. We are uh, here in <clears throat> a part of the garden which is half in light and half in darkness. The sun is shining through the branches of the Elanthus, the tree of heaven, as though heaven's blessing is being given to the whole scene with the rising sun here. But at the same time, this is a scene which will take place in, in darkness. And so both those aspects we're thinking of, and we have actually lit the brazier because the brazier becomes very, very much part of the sign of this day. It's the sign of Peter sitting beside it, a charcoal fire in the courtyard of the high priest's house, where his denial takes place after his brave promises. It's also the sign of the resurrection narrative on the lakeside, which we shall think of in our Easter days next week together and that of course is when they come to shore find Jesus there and a charcoal fire on both occasions the charcoal fire sign of denial sign of forgiveness today we're thinking of many things in our world we've news of those terrible floods in Durban, in South Africa, where so many have lost their lives, uh, certainly 300 already, uh, and where then, uh, if you think back, if you saw anything of our, our conversation last night with Bishop Rose and me, once again we were thinking of the things which have changed our perception of certainty in our world at this time, both the uh, pandemic and also the climate change and now the war and the sense of Europe being in conflict. We pray for the people of Ukraine on this day, this Maundy Thursday, and pray for them in the enormous danger they're in from war, those who are still in Ukraine, and also the millions who have gone to safety and hospitality in other places. Those things which have taken away so much of our certainty and affected things like our economies and, and th all sorts of things we took for granted. So our prayers are for all those in any kind of desperate need today as we begin Maundy Thursday. We'll start our prayers and so many of these themes will come out in the lessons and prayers that we're reading. Bring your own intentions wherever you are in the world. O Lord, open our lips and our mouths shall proclaim your praise. Let your ways be known upon earth, your saving power among the nations. Blessed are you, Lord God of our salvation. To you be praise and glory forever. As a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, your only Son was lifted up that he might draw the whole world to himself. May we walk this day in the way of the cross and always be ready to share its weight Declaring your love for all the world, blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. The night has passed and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. As we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. So our psalm this morning is Psalm 71, one of the two psalms for the 14th morning of the month, but it is a very apt one when one thinks of Jesus' own loneliness and the betrayal and the uh, desertion of friends around him, which are all part of this story. In you, O Lord, do I seek refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your righteousness, deliver me and set me free. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be for me a stronghold to which I may ever resort. Send out to save me, for you are my rock and my fortress. 
Deliver me, my God, from the hand of the wicked, from the grasp of the evildoer and the oppressor. For you are my hope, O Lord God, my confidence even from my youth. <laughs> Upon you have I leaned from my birth, when you drew me from my mother's womb. My praise shall be always of you. I have become a portent to many, but you are my refuge and my strength. Let my mouth be full of your praise and your glory all the day long. And do not cast me away in the time of old age. Forsake me not when my strength fails. For my enemies are talking against me, and those who lie in wait for my life take counsel together. They say, God has forsaken him. Pursue him and take him, because there is none to deliver him. O God, be not far from me. Come quickly to help me, O my God. Let those who are against me be put to shame and disgrace. Let those who seek to do me evil be covered with scorn and reproach. But as for me, I will hope continually and will praise you more and more. My mouth shall tell of your righteousness and salvation all the day long, for I know no end of the telling. I will begin with the mighty works of the Lord God. I will recall your righteousness, yours alone. O God, you have taught me since I was young, and to this day I tell of your wonderful works. Forsake me not, O God, when I am old and grey-headed, until I make known your deeds to the next generation and your power to all that are to come. Your righteousness, O God, reaches to the heavens. In the great things you have done, who is like you, O God? What troubles and adversities you have shown me, and yet you will turn and refresh me and bring me from the deep of the earth again. Increase my honour, turn again and comfort me. Therefore will I praise you upon the harp for your faithfulness, O my God. I will sing to you with the lyre, O Holy One of Israel. My lips will sing out as I play to you, and so will my soul, which you have redeemed. My tongue also will tell of your righteousness all the day long, for they shall be shamed and disgraced who sought to do me evil. We're going now to the fourth gospel that's been our companion through these days for several months now. And today we turn from the teaching of Jesus, the discourse of Jesus at supper table and also in the temple courtyard, as we saw, all happening at night. And we think then also of how that went through to the next part of the story. Now, at this point, the fourth gospel turns into narrative. And the reading of the four gospels has always been part of Holy Week. So I'm going to read the, the whole of chapter 18 of John's gospel today. And because part of that takes place at night, that is going to use some of the footage from last year's three hours presentation which we did only online if you remember because at that time we were not able to worship easily in the cathedral with it. This year's will be a full three hours service which Canon Emma is taking from the cathedral itself online but what you see of the paschal full moon at night with the brazier is from last year which is still obtain obtainable online uh, and so uh, you're seeing that from then with the Paschal full moon. And one remembers that Passover takes place at the time of full moon. Here is chapter 18 of John, and then we'll talk about it when we get to the end. But we are reading the narrative. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. 
So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have not lost one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of these disciples, are you? Peter said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple, where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When Jesus had said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? Annas then sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, You also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it. And at once a cock crowed. Then, then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. It was early morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered him, If this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. The Jews said to Pilate, It is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show 
by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the King of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. Pilate said to him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, King is your word. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? And after that, after he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. That takes us to the narrative at the end of chapter 18. And the story tells itself, but there are many things about it that we note. First of all, let's say there is an assumed knowledge of the other accounts, or at least the stories that make up the other accounts in the other three Gospels, which clearly had been travelling around from Christian community to Christian community from the eyewitness accounts of all that happened. And this Gospel doesn't retell everything, but notice the reference to the prayer which Jesus pray, prayed on in the Garden of Gethsemane. That prayer is not given to us in this Gospel, it's given to us in the others, but the words about the cup that the Father has given him to drink, being received, are there in the story as told by John, referencing us back, as Mary and Martha were referenced back to other Gospels. But also this is happening, as we've said, in a different time frame. We not only have the, the sense, the deep sense at this time when Jesus is talking about truth, of the two different levels on which Jesus has been talking throughout this Gospel. But we also have the sense of this being the day of preparation and that hurry which is necessary so that everything can be done, dispatched and Jesus dead by the time the sun sets so that a body shall not hang on the cross on the day of Passover is very evident in all of this. The day of preparation and they are act and the, the, the Jewish authorities have purified themselves so they cannot enter the Roman governor's own house. It would be to make themselves unclean once again so that they could not themselves then celebrate the Passover. And here we're talking about the high priest, the one that will go into the Holy of Holies. All of this is there in this time frame which this fourth gospel has given us. Let's start, though, in the Garden of Gethsemane. For here we have the power of the sentence, or the three words, which we've heard several times in the Gospel of St. John. I am he. And that I am has been heard not just several times, but many times in the Gospel of St. John. The present tense of the Word made flesh, and the present tense of all that he gave to those who would carry on that work through the gifts of the Holy Spirit and still gives today on this Maundy Thursday, so much later. 
so that we then become those who are in the present tense with all that is going on here and can identify with some of the fears that are going on too. I am he and the words are so powerful that they draw back draw back and, and in, in falling they fall over one another because there is a sense of them knowing that this man is something different. They've been in the city of Jerusalem they know what the crowds are saying they know what some of the council are thinking think of Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus M much of that was known and the words I am he drive them back and they fall over one another and then Jesus who himself is anxious that he should drink the cup that the Father has offered to him referring back once again to that prayer in Gethsemane and he's already consecrated himself in the temple with his own high priestly prayer before crossing the brook and going into the Garden of Gethsemane but he's now conscious that his own followers need protection and so he says Who, whom are you seeking? and they say once again in singularity Jesus of Nazareth I've said to you I am he so the inference is you are seeking me I willingly give myself to you but let these men go and at that point he knows he stands physically alone Jesus of Nazareth and the, the, the sense of the, the handing over and the way in which as he calls himself the son of man the representative of our humanity will be lifted up is very present in all of this there is a consciousness about how this will play out in these dark hours of the night when according to custom the day of preparation has already started at sunset and then through the hours of the night no one's going to get much sleep on on this night Pilate will be wakened early the rest will be awake all night and Caiaphas is very very busy assembling the council and wants a quick judgment but he wants a death sentence so he knows also he will have a trip to the governor to make as well with the prisoner I am he well let's go then to the courtyard of the high priest and there one of the disciples and we can only speculate as to which that one was was it the beloved disciple who never names himself in this gospel and is traditionally thought to be the, the gospel of John the son, son of Zebedee and then with other hands of his own Johannine community putting this together many many years later and whoever that disciple who was very much a, 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 a conscious of knowing the high priest and the household came out and said to the servant girl this man can come in and for the first time as the servant girl lets Peter in is the accusation the question you're not one of the man's disciples are you now we have a very different sentence three words just as I am he but this time I am not a negative there is the first denial I am not using those words that Jesus had spoken so often as the sign and renouncing them what a terrible thing for this disciple who has promised so much and then flesh and blood and fail him in fear he's come this far his steps are still taking him to warm himself by the brazier but it's not over yet for Peter and Jesus meanwhile is taken bound now this first is an interview with Annas who had been high priest and had been deposed by the Romans but as with uh, those who have been if one thinks of, of uh, the presidents of the United States for example when they are no longer president they're still called president and this high priest had enormous respect he was the father-in-law of the high priest at that time Caiaphas and the the Inquisition starts at that point and, and Jesus 
answers the high priest by saying, there are many, many witnesses to what I have said, and witnesses are essential in justice. Ask them what I said, and because this is stalling, one of the officers strikes Jesus. And Jesus again says, rather questioning, is this how the law proceeds? If, if I have spoken wrongly, tell me what I said wrong. If not, why strike me? And then the Inquisition will move on to Caiaphas, but not before Peter once again, standing by the brazier, has been challenged. And this time, uh, challenged by uh, one of the witnesses who had been a, a, a relative of the, the high priest's servant, whose ear Peter had cut off. And so that would show these little bits of detail coming in from this particular tradition. But the important thing is the first, the second of the questions comes again as a question. You're not one of this man's disciples, are you? And Peter again, I am not, standing by the brazier. But it's followed up. But you're a Galilean, surely you are. And then Peter denies absolutely that he is one of Jesus' disciples. Three denials, and the cock crows. Now, nothing in this gospel is said at that point to Peter's shame. Nothing is said. Nothing saying the Lord turned and looked at Peter, as in St. Luke's gospel. Nothing saying he went outside and wept bitterly. Simply the facts. Jesus, I am he. And if you want me, Jesus of Nazareth, then take me and let these men go. And saying only the words he's said to those who have come to him and to whom he's wanting to give the gift that the Father has given him to give to all, even to the shedding of his blood. But now with Peter, it's the other way round. I am not. And three times the denial and the cock crowing and it's left there until this scene is reawakened by the brazier on the lakeside right at the end of the gospel we'll come back to that of course in easter tide for the moment we are here with jesus before caiaphas and caiaphas is going fast he wants this done quickly he's not going to be thwarted and when he's got his judgment, which he gets quickly and is not really much in need of witnesses, they're not mentioned here, he has to scuttle off with the prisoner to the governor. It's not going to be easy for the governor's being woken. It was early, it's being said now, it was early, meaning that the sun has risen on this day of preparation, but they are on skates. And they come to Pilate and they can't go in because they purified themselves for all that must happen at the Passover. But the deadline is sunset for Jesus' death. He has to be dead by sunset and off the cross. So Caiaphas, who is not without power because the city of Jerusalem is a boiling cauldron of people at this time and they're thinking all kinds of different things and at this time they've all gone to bed when they get up they'll find something completely different is happening but at the moment here they are at daybreak at the governor's house and Pilate's fairly tetchy about everything and the conversation begins to happen what is interesting here is Jesus himself who's taken in as the prisoner to the governor's headquarters and the Jewish officials standing outside and Pilate going backwards and forwards because he can't get his head round this. He can't think how this prisoner looking so utterly unlike a king is standing before him bound and the chief priests are demanding a death sentence. And he, as the representative of Roman order and imperial Rome, is there standing facing Jesus. It's an extraordinary picture. And Pilate, in the beginning, probably his voice is, is almost cynical. 
about king. But Jesus rejects the word king, political leader. King is your word, is the best paraphrase of that. I came to bear witness to the truth. And Pilate, confounded by this, and really wanting a good political solution, uh, and not really wanting any much more conversation of this sort, goes, says to, to, uh, to Jesus, what, what is truth? And then goes back outside and said, but there's no cause for me to give a death sentence here. And then to perhaps uh, find a compromise situation. You, you, you have a, a, a custom that I release to you, a prisoner at Pentecost, at, uh, at Passover. Shall I release this man? There's no cause for him to be given a death sentence. But he has misread their intention to the depth of his being and to the depth of their being. They want a death sentence. They want it now. He's the only one who can give it. And they become absolutely firm. And Pilate sees that he absolutely can't prevail. He asks them if he might release Jesus. They ask instead in this political battle of ping pong for the release of a notorious insurrectionist and murderer, Barabbas. Last sort of person they'd have wanted released if they didn't want Jesus dead. Pilate has been outplayed in this political game. The manoeuvring is over. He doesn't physically in this gospel wash his hands of it. He does in the other gospels and the inference is that we know that story already. But what he does do is get rid of his responsibility and says, it's nothing to do with me, the bowl of water, meaning nothing to do with me, just as Jesus' bowl of water on this Maundy Thursday evening in a service which will be enacted tonight in our liturgy in the cathedral, says as he washes the disciples' feet, by that gesture, not in words, you are everything to do with me. And I will ensure your safety for the moment. He's allowed them to run away and leave him. If you want me, take me, let these men go. But Pilate, who is the only one with power to save Jesus now, says, OK, this seems to be what you want. Be it on your own heads. And it's over. From now on, we're into the way of the cross. And that will happen as we look at our worship tomorrow and continue this particular story. This week, as I said, is all about narratives and we learn from the narratives. And this day of preparation when Jesus will hang on the cross has been effected illegally in many ways. The law really shouldn't be happening and judgment shouldn't be happening in the night. It ought to be happening in the day. The witnesses are not really there which can give the, the proper story all of that doesn't matter they want this man dead and because they're terrified that their own position will be so compromised by his activity that the romans will come and destroy the city that was what caiaphas said when he prophesied it was better for one man to die than the whole nation to be destroyed and here is pilate effecting their will so that a roman crucifixion will actually fulfill Jesus' prophecy that the Son of Man, the representative of our humanity, which is what he would call himself, Son of God is only received by him when he is talking about us all being children of God. Son of Man is something he very often uses because he is here as the Word made flesh to share our human condition and to show how God's image through the work of the Holy Spirit can be our image too, day by day, with the gift of every day. Today will be a day in the cathedral of many services. The first service, which will begin to happen in a few hours' time at 11 o'clock, with the uh, Bishop of Dover celebrating and the Archbishop preaching, will be the blessing of the holy oils, and at the same time, uh, the renewal of the vows of all those who live with vows. So all the clergy of the diocese who can make it will come into the cathedral and we shall renew our vows. 
and I shall remember most specifically because I shall renew the vows as a deacon and renew the vows as a priest and then those who are consecrated bishops will renew their vows and many who have come who in lay ministry and in their own way want to make their a renewal of their vows will be there too as we worship together but I shall particularly be thinking how 50 years ago in 1972 I made those first vows as a deacon and those vows have been repeated each year and that role as a deacon the diakonos is a role which Jesus himself enacts by washing the disciples feet an act of service for that is what the deacon is there for to perform acts of service and to the welfare of others and those vows I shall happily make again this morning tonight very differently this whole story of the supper table and the foot washing will be enacted liturgically as will the desertion of the disciples as the service ends in darkness and the sense of them leaving Jesus absolutely utterly alone and the watch before the altar which will continue until midnight all those things liturgically but for the moment here in the garden there is a date I wanted to remember this morning and that is the fact that on this day the 14th of April in 1889 the English historian and philosopher of history Arnold J Toynbee was born he died in 1975 um, I make that 86, his, at the age of 86. Now, from 1918 till 1950, Arnold Toynbee was a leading specialist on international affairs. And we could talk a, a lot about that because he was used in terms of the Foreign Office. He was himself uh, in his, his uh, public life. Uh, a tutor and fellow of ancient history at Balliol College, Oxford, and also uh, after the Great War was consulted quite a lot on solutions about how nations thought about themselves, which culture should be made into nations with boundaries, and as you well know the Treaty of Versailles, which ended finally the Great War, was uh, very much a time when all kinds of new nations were created in Europe and Toynbee was trying to define what caused a nation to feel that it was a nation and he advised all kinds of plebiscites, referenda if you like, about how nations wanted to be and he himself studied this. Now his, his great work which was published in sections, and it is absolutely massive, is charting, attempting to get an insight into what makes political things and nations and leaders of nations interact with one another and feel that they are a nation and others to threaten them in some way. Well, nothing could be uh, uh, more realistic with that kind of intention than what's going on in Ukraine today and certainly Ukraine and Poland and all those nations thereabouts were, were very much on Toynbee's list because the great empires of Europe had fractured and so somehow the Congress at Versailles had to make up a new Europe and to uh, get a, a, a definition of how to do that. Well I can't uh, spend too much time on this because we've lots of things to do today but that sense of self-determination was high on Toynbee's list and if I read the titles of these volumes and they are massive volumes and he was a person who was much much studied translated into so many languages. So volumes one and two were called the Genesis of Civilizations and they were published in 1934. Volume 3, The Growth of Civilizations, in the plural. Volume 4, The Breakdowns of Civilizations, 
Toynbee was a classical scholar and delved well back into classical civilization too. So Imperial Rome and classical Greek, Greece and the kingdoms before that of Persia and ancient Egypt and other places in the world were grist to his mill. But all of those, the growth of civilizations, the breakdowns of civilization, and then two volumes, five and six, on the disintegrations of civilizations, published in 1939, very auspicious year. And then in volume, eight, from volume seven, universal states and universal churches. Toynbee was a great one for seeing how the Christian faith had shaped a concept, as so many religions had shaped a concept of what it meant to be a society. Eight is the heroic ages, contacts between civilizations in terms of space, I don't mean space, I mean space across the world. Nine is contacts between civilizations in time, law and freedom in history, the prospects of the Western civilization. And then ten, the inspirations of historians. A note on chronology, rather good after we've looked on the last three nights about what time both Kronos and Kairos means. And then the last two books, not published till 1960 and 61, 11 was an historical atlas and gazetteer which helped you understand all that had been on in the other books, and 12 reconsiderations looking back from 1961. Well, it's hardly surprising that historians looking at this now have pushed this great works aside and said he's too interested in allegories and religions and myths and great uh, speculations across the world. That's not history. History is facts in little details being put together. Well, is it? Or is it what he is saying? Great swathes of time and not only our bodies and our minds, but also our spirits embracing that too. Certainly Toynbee is not much read these days, his name is very well known, but at the same time that sense of Jesus standing before the might of Imperial Rome, one representing the Kingdom of Heaven, one representing the mightiest empire that had been known until that time, I think almost uh, of, of little St Francis kneeling before Pope Innocent III as being a, a similar kind of juxtaposition. But here we are on this Maundy Thursday thinking back on that story, the early morning of the day of preparation, the Friday by then, when Jesus will hang on the cross and Pilate knows not what he is facing but makes a political solution. But we well know that we shall make a theological solution, which the Church has embraced, and use that in our own way in a spiritual solution. For Jesus still says to us on this Maundy Thursday morning, I am He, and we embrace that in our spirits and try to live up to that and are glad that the brazier which makes its appearance in denial and faithlessness makes a reappearance in the days of resurrection for forgiveness and a promise given three times of faithfulness to be the one that really will be the rock on which Jesus founded his church. Let's then move to our prayers on this day we are praying today in our Anglican Communion for the Diocese of Kuronegala in the extra-provincial uh, uh, diocese, uh, province rather, of the Church of Ceylon, as it's still called, the island Sri Lanka. And uh, then in the diocese we are praying for Archbishop Justin, who will very soon now be in the cathedral and will be with us across this Triduum, the three days as we call them, uh, and Bishop Rose who will be celebrating the Chrism Mass this morning, and then the uh, Bishop Emma at Lambeth, and 
in this diocese, the village is around Ospringe, in the Ospringe area deanery, and we're praying for the area dean there, Steve Lillicrap, and all those who assist in that ministry. No doubt Steve will be in the cathedral a bit later on to renew his vows. So here's the prayer for this Holy Week, and then the prayer for Lent, the last day we'll use it. Most merciful God, who by the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, delivered and saved the world, grant that by faith in him who suffered on the cross, we may triumph in the power of his victory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the prayer for Lent. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing that you have made, and forgive the sins of all those who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts, that we, worthily lamenting our sins and acknowledging our wretchedness, may receive from you the God of all mercy, perfect remission and forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So each in our own way and in our own languages, the prayer our Saviour taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. So, a time for reflection now on this highly significant day of our Christian year as we worship together. music you've been listening to, the Lacrimosa from Mozart's Requiem, as 
tears well up of guilt and shame in Peter, and tears begin to flow from those who loved Jesus as he is led out to crucifixion. This was sung by our King's School Choir and played by the King's School Orchestra uh, in the cathedral in 2017. Christ crucified draw you to himself to find in him a sure ground for faith, a firm support for hope and the assurance of sins forgiven and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you, upon those whom you love, this Maundy Thursday and always. Amen. Well, let's look at our riddle. You're being a very, very peaceful cat this morning, aren't you, Tiger? Nice sunshine, warmth on one side from the brazier and warmth on the other from the sun. And also no sign of Leo. <laughs> uh, yesterday, what did we ask? I think we asked, I am as old as the earth, but I am renewed every month. No better answer today after watching that Paschal full moon is the answer, the moon. And you have one, but others use yours more than you do. And that is, of course, a name. And the calling of the name becomes an enormously important part of both the uh, narrative, but also especially the resurrection narrative, when the name causes the recognition of Jesus, or to underline what he wants of the one he's speaking to. Well, here are two more. And... Uh, the first is, I have teeth, but cannot bite. What am I? And the other, until I am measured, I am not known. Yet how you miss me when I have flown. What am I? And then lastly, this morning, the lost words and we've come now, yesterday we were the Skylark, and today we are, oops, tiger, uh, we're with a bird that's very common here in the garden, a magpie. And uh, magpies are very beautiful birds, but also they are thieves of other birds' eggs and uh, are quite destructive of that. So we have, shall we say, mixed feelings about magpies, but they are very beautiful. And when the sun catches their plumage, they're as big as Corny Crow, who is on the roof at the moment, and, and uh, is actually in the sunshine. His black feathers are fantastic. But magpies are big. And here's the acrostic going down for the magpie. Magpie manifesto, argue every toss, gossip, bicker, yak and snicker all day long. Pick a fight in an empty room, interrupt, interject, intercept, intervene. Every magpie for every magpie against every other walking, flying, swimming, creeping creature on the earth. They are collective birds. And let me just open the pages because I think it'll probably, yes, it'll give us two magpies here, building a wonderful nest, which they do, and looking very beautiful indeed, but as we, I think it's hard to see in the, the camera. <laughs> you can't get it. <laughs> Up. Got it. Okay, there we are. Um, and uh, magpies, um, are said, and uh, I have a, a, a book talking about customs of birds, magpies are said if, they're, if one dies to bring a, a leaf or a blade of grass as they come up to, to drop on, on the body itself. Uh, I don't know, I've never seen that happen, but it's, it's written down as a custom of magpies. What we do know about magpies is that there is an old superstition 
that if you see one, it's for sorrow, and two is for joy. And if you get to the end of the rhyme, seven is a secret that's never to be told. And uh, it used to be very, very uncommon to see seven magpies. Now, practically, because they have increased and increased in their numbers, it's not at all unusual to have secrets that are never to be told and generally are told. So let's uh, then go off to many services in the cathedral. And uh, it's always when one's got the most beautiful day that <laughs> you find yourself inside. But uh, we shall do that and go and renew our vows. But have a good day with, with whatever you are doing yourself. And uh, then tomorrow we shall meet again for Good Friday itself. Every blessing for this day. So, oh, tiger, this seat's a bit wobbly. You all right? You're going to stay out here, I would have thought, aren't you? Are you? Yeah. Nothing to disturb your peace. And the smoke has dropped a bit now, which is nice. I don't think that was to your taste, and I don't think the robin actually likes the smoke. So we shall find him on a better day uh, when we come without smoke. Yes, it's getting in your eyes again, isn't it? Old song, smoke gets in your eyes. Standing in the courtyard, warming in the night, the day had been the one I'd loved so much, the one who made me whole. Just then a young man came to me, looked me in the face. He said, I've seen you here before, I know you from this place. We argued and I lied to him and cursed him as he spoke. And the words like thorns came from my mouth and I began to choke.